The church in Philadelphia. So we have one more church after this. That's the church in Laodicea. And we'll look at that next week. But the church in Philadelphia represents the historical church period of the 18th and 19th century. So as we get to the church next week, we'll see the 20th century straight on to where we are today. Um, I'm going to read straight through verses 7 through 13, and then we'll break it down. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, he who is true, who has opened the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie, and I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I will also keep you from the hour of testing, uh, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly, hold fast what you have, so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now Philadelphia... Philadelphia, the city itself, it's known, the word Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love. It means brotherly love. But it wasn't named the city of brotherly love or Philadelphia because the people were so kind to one another. That's not what it was. It, it, it was named that way because there was a king at the very beginning of the city when they first started uh, and built the city. He saw how beautiful it was. And it was just a precious looking city. It had rolling hills and vineyards and it was just beautiful. And he loved his brother dearly, so he gave his brother the city and they named it the city of brotherly love. That's how it became Philadelphia. It was a very prosperous city. Again, it had rolling hills and vineyards. It, was, um, it excelled in the export of some of the finest wines in all of Asia Minor, and it had a very strong theater arts center that was there. Around 17 AD, um, there was a massive earthquake that destroyed the whole city, everything in it, and it was, it was unbelievably devastated, and so were it many of the cities surrounding it. Um, it was leveled so bad, uh, and the aftershocks of that earthquake went on for almost three years. Every time they tried to rebuild, it got crashed down again. And they tried to rebuild, crushed down again. It was so devastated out of all the other cities that by the time when the Romans had taken over, they allowed Philadelphia to not have to pay their taxes for five years so that they could have the money to build the city because there was so much devastation. And so they were so thrilled with the Roman Empire, who at the time was Tiberius Caesar. Um, he helped them rebuild it. They named the city neo Caesarea, which means new Caesar. And so everybody was happy with that until he died and a new Caesar took over and he was real not a good guy. He forced the city of Philadelphia to rip up most of its grapevines because he wanted Rome to be the wine-producing capital of the world. And so they hated his guts with that. And so behind his back, in spite of him, they renamed the city Philadelphia. That's how they got the name, Philadelphia. So they had bounced around a little bit. But what happened to Philadelphia because of this, they began to not trust the government to oversee them. They began to really distrust the Roman governing authorities. And they were saying, you know something? <clears throat> we'll pay your taxes but we will never trust you again because you came in here and you destroyed us. You tried to destroy what we've had all the way from the very beginning, this great wine crop and, 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 and all that was there. So the city of brotherly love had begun to become the city of distrust of the governing authorities. And we're going to see what that has to do with Jesus speaking to the church in Philadelphia. Now, the... the Religion of the city was the worship of the god Bacchus, which is Dinoceros, is the god of wine and merriment. 
and people would dance around happily and that's where you go back to Pan and you had half goat and half man and he would play his little flute and people would have these orgies up in the, up in the uh, vine groves and wherever the grapes were to produce a great harvest. That's what the worship of the god uh, Bacchus was all about. They would hold these week-long drinking binges and, and it was immoral. And, and it's all because the city was so full of these vineyards that were there. Um, they wanted their crops to be plentiful. Now, Philadelphia, the church age, from the 18th to the 19th century, it represents the Great Awakening, um, a time in church history when the Bride of Christ no longer trusted Roman Catholicism, but began to separate herself from it, and even willing to meet under great persecution in small groups for prayer for years, where a Bible was not allowed until men began to translate the Bible into German and into different languages, and it, it got to go out into little groups of people. There's the birth of the Protestant Reformation uh, and, and all that. It was also a time when the church would go out into the world with no financial support at all. To pull away from Roman Catholicism meant you have no more ties. And you go out to share the gospel, you're going out all by yourself, simply trusting the Lord for direction and guidance wherever they went to share the gospel. It was a time when families refused to hear from their children about the love of God. You know something? You packed up, you moved out of the house, you became a freak following Jesus, and I'm, we're still Catholic, and we're right and I don't want to hear about Jesus. Don't even bring up a word. In fact, I heard a story about this Jewish guy that went to his rabbi. And he said, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. And the rabbi said, what is it? And he said, my son moved out of the house and became a Christian. And he said, oh, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. My son moved out of the house and became a Christian. And, and he said to this rabbi, what are we going to do about that? He said, let's go to God. And they knelt down. They said, Lord, what do we do about this? God said, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. <laughs> My son did the same thing, right? Yeah. Watch it. But this is a time frame when parents would not hear. And if you grew up like I did, you grew up Catholic and you know that whole core of things and you talk to your aunts and your uncles or your family and you tell them about the love of God, tell them about Jesus Christ and this wall goes up. It's still alive today, in, in, especially in the New England area. So, you know, what happened was parents had been misdirected by Catholicism away from the word. And when their children came to Christ, they grabbed hold of the word that is now translated in their language. Um, it was a time when jo John Bunyan, George Whitfield, John Wesley, William Carey, David Livingston, Hudson Taylor, you all, these are all the names, they, they, they brought God's word across the world and revival broke out all across the world because they brought the gospel out. They brought the truth of God's word. You have Charles Spurgeon, Charles Finney, Dwight L. Moody. By the direction of God's Holy Spirit, they brought a fresh new light and a fresh new life of the word of God into the Christian church during a time of church history when the light of, it was dark. So God's love and light pierced darkness. And it began to bring the light of the truth of God's love out into people. And what happened was the church that was, like we saw last week, that was dead, was then birthed into life. You went from the 17th century of total darkness with just a little glimpse of light all of a sudden to the 18th and 19th century and an explosion took place where Christ is now magnified and glorified. I look back on, in studying this, you look at, like, if you study Wesley at all, you study um, Moody, you just study all the great men from old, if they would have come back into the churches that are called by their name today, they'd pass out. They would, they would sit there and go, what is going on? When did you become religious? 
When did the word of man become more important to you than the word of God? Why are you arguing over things that you shouldn't even be talking about? Where's Christ in your life? Where's Christ in your heart? These, these men I spoke of, and, and thousands more that gave their lives to bring the gospel to the front where it belonged. And the battle it was that against Roman Catholicism. What a time uh, for that. So the historical age, a very strong one that leads into the next century. Now, the church itself that was in Philadelphia, it was, it was during a time, it was birthed by the Lord during a time of great distrust uh, in the government. The church in Philadelphia, they would meet in synagogues on Sunday, and, and most of the families who were still Jewish would meet there on Saturday. And if you want to be a Christian, well, that's your problem, but, you know, we'll be there and, and walk out our own Judaism uh, it's a time when families start to turn in their own children um, because, to the government because their children's faith in Jesus Christ was not in the government leadership. And people began to, to turn their own kids in. You know, it's almost like you can, if you want to go have your own Jesus, go do it, but keep him out of our family. Keep him out of our church. Don't tell church leadership anything about Christ. In fact, don't even bring up the word of God. Who are you? You're not a priest. You don't have any right to talk about it. And yet, and yet God had given his word for us in that. So the, the history of the church and the suffering that they endured, um, endured by not trusting in the government churches, just by simply trusting in Jesus Christ and the word of God, it's really important to grasp hold of that because it has a lot to do with what Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia. And unlike all the other churches in Revelation that Jesus writes to outside of Smyrna, uh, this is one that he registers no complaint to. And more than that, this is the church that he says he delights in. He takes great delight in this church because they proclaim the gospel in the face of great uh, darkness in that. So as we take a closer look at, at the message he gives to the believers in Philadelphia, I, he, just, he addresses them in a really extraordinary way in a way he doesn't address any other church. Let's look into it, verse seven. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, he says, says this. So the first thing Jesus does here, he tells the believers in Philadelphia who he is. He says, he is the one who is holy. This is really important because it means, holy here means morally perfect in character without flaw. And he says, it, you stop looking at the priest. He's human. He's not holy. That he's a man and he's flawed in character. And he's immorally impure. He's impure. So he's saying, this is me. This is who I am. I am the one who who is true, he says. And when he says true here, it means he's genuinely objective reality. He's the one who's behind all that truly exists. This is me, Jesus. I am the, one, the only one who is completely morally pure without fault or flaw in character and I am the one who is objective reality I am behind all that truly exists in fact we're told in the book of Hebrews he holds it all together every atom in your body every cell structure is held together by him and that we're told to trust in by faith in that. And the second thing Jesus says here is what he does. Uh, he said he holds the key of David. That's in reference to an incident in Isaiah 22. In the days of King Hezekiah, there was a palace chief of staff named Shebna, and he was dishonest. He used his power and his position to enrich himself. He was actually one of the first scam artists that was out there. When you look, he had this power, he had influence, and he realized if I use these two things, I can really make something of myself. Yet he was given power and influence by the king to oversee God's people. 
and he wouldn't do it. So, you know, you look at Revelation 3, 7, and he says, the key of David who opens and uh, no one can shut and shuts what no one can open. He's, this is the prophecy of a, of a man um, that would take his place because that Shebna was going to go to Babylon and die in disgrace. God prophesied that. And this man, Elkham, would come and take his place. And, and so he's saying in this letter to Philadelphia, this is, this is what I do. You know, this is who I am. I am he who is holy. And don't look to anyone else to be holy for you. And then, I am he, this is what I do. I hold the key of David. I open what, what no man can open. I shut what no man can shut. So this is, his will cannot be opposed. Understand this. You may stomp your foot down and say, nope, I am not going to listen to you. I am not going to go down that road. And you will never, ever, ever be able to oppose the will of God. Because his will will be complete. With you or without you. And that's just period. And, and that also that he governs all the events of history on this planet. That's what he's saying here. Not one door opens that I don't allow to open. And not one door will shut that I don't allow to shut. I, when I open a door, it's me who opens it. And when I shut it, it's me who shuts it. So he governs all events of this, the history of this planet. And he opens some doors and closes others. And the doors that he opens remain open. And the doors that he closed are undeniably locked. And no power on earth can breach what he has determined to keep closed. So he lets them know, this is who I am and this is what I do. If I call you and tell you to go proclaim the gospel and you face all kinds of opposition, then you need to know right now, he who is holy has called you to do this labor. And when you face your opposition and you face the difficulties before you, remember who sent you. You remember the message that I gave you, the truth of who I am and what I've done on the cross. That's what goes out there. Too many times people take eschatology, last day stuff, and they try to share the gospel with people through it. It doesn't work. All you get is a bunch of scared people that are, that are afraid to die. No, they don't look towards the love of Christ. And they don't receive the love of Christ. They receive the end time pressure that's there. and they never, they never really get conformed into the image of Christ. So he's saying, this is who I am. This is what I do. So Jesus, the one who's holy, uh, literally not any man overseeing some religious work. It's Jesus Christ who opens the doors of ministry and he closes them when he desires. So, you know, you can blame anybody you want if a door of ministry opened for you and then closed. You got to go right back to the word. Who did it? Jesus did it. Why? Ask him. Settle it. Be settled in that in your heart. Because another door won't open until it is. He doesn't open a door if you, if you can't be settled in a door that he closed. And what he opens stays open, and what he closes, he closes. In verse 8, I know your deeds. Behold, I've put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So now he tells the church how he'll use his power to open and close doors, right? So um, there's a cause and effect principle here. Jesus opened the door for the believers in, the, in Philadelphia. He says right here, I've opened the door that no one can shut. That's going to be the great reformation that takes off in all these men that are called by God to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that door to this day has never been shut. God opened it. And they evangelized the world, all of them. Um, and he says, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So he opened the door for the believers in Philadelphia because the church had fulfilled certain conditions. Because they had little power and because they had kept the word of God and because they did not deny his name. And any time any individual believer or church fulfills these conditions, a door of ministry is always open for them to serve Christ in. 
and stepping in that direction. He says they had little power. It means they had discovered to some degree the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is really important because that's something that's misaligned in our day and age today. The power of the Holy Spirit is not found in human strength. And it's not found loud at the altar. The power of the Holy Spirit is not people jumping up and down during a worship conference and, and, and crying out his name. The power of the Holy Spirit is the spiritual power of faith. And this spiritual power comes from faith only by expecting God to act. God said, I've given you my word. In my word is the truth of my good news. Do you believe it? I do. Then go proclaim it. Well, they don't want to hear what you have to say. That's not believing my word. That's not using the power of the Holy Spirit. I, by faith, I expect you to do what you're going to do. By faith, I expect God to work. Do you know I come up here every week and I teach his word? I fully expect God to take his word and to work in your heart something of himself to conform you more into his image. And for that to happen, sometimes he's got to expose to you the true darkness of your heart that you don't want to face. He's got to bring it out and bring it out to the open. And then take it and show you, I've wanted to heal this for years, but you never let me in. I've wanted to change direction here, but no, you're so in charge and you're so this, and you know where you're going and no one's going to tell you what to do. Especially me, because you never let me in. Well, I fully expect God, by the teaching of his word, to work in your heart. And I do that by faith. You know how I do that by faith? By watching you come in week after week after week after week after year after year and to keep my mouth shut and fully expect God to work by faith. That means it's not going to happen tomorrow. And I'm going to trust him by faith and get up and do it again. And I'm going to trust him by faith and get up and do it again. And I'm going to trust him by faith and get up and do it again until he takes me home. Because I fully expect him to work. He says to him, you have little power. And, and, and that power is not found in human strength. But it's the spiritual power of faith by expecting God to act. The church in Philadelphia was filled with believers who sensed that God could really act in human events. So you know what they did? They looked for opportunities to respond to whatever God was doing, and doors of ministry opened up to them to, for service and to evangelize for Christ to the world around them. That's why Paul would write in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Trust by faith and step into it and believe God at his word. And for you and I, just like the church in Philadelphia, God's prepared in advance good works for us to do. That's why you and I have received salvation and we're still here. This is a labor he wants you to do. But it's not a labor he wants you to be in charge of. It's a labor he wants to be in charge of and he wants you to be an instrument in it. Too many people in today's day and age, they go, okay, I, God called me, get out of the way, I'm in charge. Who's in charge? God's in charge. Are you really in charge? Then, then what kind of instrument are you in the hand of God? You look at the church historical age from the 18th century to the 19th century, these, you find men that were surrendered to the work of God. D.L. Moody spent years evangelizing people before he ever received the power of the Holy Spirit. So he had two ladies came up to him one day after service. They said, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He was like, I think I am. They're like, you're not. So he got into, I think he went to a motel room or something and laid down on the ground for a day or two days and said, Lord, fill me, fill me. And God began to fill him with his spirit so much so he cried out, stop, stop. I'm, I can't take it anymore. And you know something? His message never changed. But the lives and hearts of people began to change. The message then lacked Moody 
and gained Christ. Get it? And in all these men, that's what God did. George Whitfield lacked George Whitfield and gained Christ. John Bunyan lacked John Bunyan and gained Christ. And what was brought forth was not someone's opinion or someone's two cents. What was brought forth was of Christ. And it changed people's lives around them. So in a very strong way, you know, the church age began to understand that, that there was a vast untapped potential power of God that resides in every single believer if they should truly trust in Christ. And I think that most churches scarcely realize the power they have for ministry. Each one of us in the body of Christ have been given spiritual gifts by God and the responsibility to use those gifts to share the gospel, to bless others, and to meet the basic human needs of life. And what Jesus says to this church that did so much, the church age especially, he says, you have little power. So what's he showing them there? He's showing them and us that it's by faith that it's time to begin to mature and using the gifts that he's given us for his glory. Little power. You know, the presence of the Holy Spirit is promised to any believer, every believer, upon salvation without any conditions whatsoever. I'm going to say that again. Listen close. The presence of the Holy Spirit is promised to every believer upon salvation without any conditions whatsoever. But the power of the Holy Spirit is given to those believers who actively choose to keep his word and not deny his name. And that's what the church had there. They kept his word. Roman Catholicism had come in and said, push that word aside. Only the priest can teach it. Come get the mass and follow along in these scriptures made by the hands of men. And there were men that said, no, this is the word of God. Martin Luther stood before a whole board in, in, in Eck as they, 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 they began to challenge him. And he said, you show me where scripture, you tell me to deny the writings that I've written. And I've written the writings of St. Peter and I've written the writings of St. Paul. You want me to deny what I've written? When it goes against, when the scripture, when it goes against my conscience and scripture, I will not refute what I wrote because that is the word of God. And they took these bold stands against such powers of darkness. And they stood upon the word of God. This is what the word of God says. I don't need to bow before a man and ask for forgiveness. I bow before Christ alone, who's, who my allegiance belongs to. And I receive forgiveness from him by his blood in that. So, you know, it's, it's uh, two dynamics that are crucial to the ministry of every believer in every church fellowship is keeping his word, not denying his name. And I think sometimes we want to have all kinds of power, but you know what? You only need a little. You need a little bit of power. And that's trusting by faith, expecting God to do what God does so it's the power and the authority of the word of God that enables you and I to know the character of Christ and to have fellowship with him and to build his character into our lives. It's what allows his name to be the identifying mark upon our lives. And we should all ask God for power. Lord, you've given me gifts. What are they? They're for your glory. I think it's high time I stop trying to figure out what my gift is and just start serving people for the glory of God. You know what? God will expose it real quick. He'll show you exactly what it is. In verse 9, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie, and I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. This is an amazing thing. Here, Jesus promises that he'll use his power to subdue the enemies of the Philadelphian believers that are there. He says, they will, they will respect you. They're going to they're gonna see that it's you. That the, my power is in you. They're going to see that clearly. They're going to acknowledge my blessing on you. You know what that means? It means people are going to know your old life, and they're going to see the new one. And they're going to go, man, you didn't do anything to, to deserve that new life. Like, no, I didn't. 
That's the, that's the Lord who did that. And make it real clear. And the synagogue of Satan here refers to the Jews in the synagogues who hated uh, other Jews, exactly, family members, because they had belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. An amazing thing back at the time of the Church of Philadelphia is everybody understood Jesus was Jewish. Today, Christianity has taken such a role, it's far stretch removed. Remember, Jesus is Jewish. And, and was he the first Christian? No, he's the Savior. We became Christians because it was a bad name, bad term. People used to mock Christians. Christos, uh, you're so kind, you're like Christ. You're like Christ. There's a guy like Christ. They used to mock him and ridicule him. And today, Christianity has become religious. I think uh, it should never be that way. Jesus says, I'll make them, those who persecute you, fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. An amazing thing. How's he going to do that? They're going to see the church respond to their opposition with the agape love of God. They're going to watch people be persecuted to death and not curse back, but love them back. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometime. And read about how many men and women died in Christ's name that were tortured horrifically and yet loved their enemy back. He says, I'm going to do this. They're going to see that I have loved you. And when they kill you, they're going to go, you know what? He, he loved them. Because I've tortured a lot of people in my life and they always scream out and cry back at me, but they wouldn't do it. And they didn't do it because they were so tough to hold back. They had joy in their faces. They had peace in their hearts. How in the world can you burn a man at the stake that has the joy of the Lord? And you watch him die. And it, it stirred hearts. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometime. It's an amazing thing. And Jesus said, that's how it's going to happen uh, he says, in your hearts, they'll, they'll be changed as the Christians in Philadelphia exhibit the results of their own personal relationship with the living Christ as they love the opposition unconditionally as they love those who persecute them. And we have that period in history. We can look up and see exactly what happened because it's exactly what happened. In verse 10, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So here Jesus gives a word of encouragement and promise. What he's speaking of here is the great tribulation, which um, we're going to walk through it, this book in Revelation and see what it's all about uh, in the weeks ahead. But he calls it a, a time of trial, and it's a time that God promised so very long ago that's coming upon the world. It's coming. And, and if you know anything about the tribulation at all that's coming, we are in the last days and the fleeting moments of time. Everything's in order. Look at the nation of Israel. Everything is exactly as God said it's going to be just before he removes his bride. We are living in that time. And it's not a time to be lax at all. Uh, and in this, he says uh, to them, I'll keep you from it. And it's really kind of cool because keeping you is the term caught up to be with him. That means before the great tribulation begins, we're caught up to be with the Lord. Paul refers to that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Do you ever see all these zombie movies out there? Zombie apocalypse and all that stuff? And people, you ask question people, where do you get that? Oh, it's in the last days. Last days, it's in the Bible. Like, it's not in the Bible. There's no zombie apocalypse. And they take this verse. Well, the dead shall rise. No, the dead in Christ shall rise and meet the Lord in the air. <laughs> and the zombies don't, there's too much. But he, he says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He's saying before that great tribulation begins and he's encouraging the church in Philadelphia, I will catch you up to myself. 
I'll pick you up to be with me in the air. And all other believers who are trusting, I'll scoop you up. Why? Because my bride is not going to face that tribulation. Because the great tribulation is the wrath of God being poured out over a seven-year period. And God doesn't bring his bride through his wrath. He removes her, and that's when the wrath begins. In fact, the time clock, we're going to see it in the next chapter. The time clock for the rapture, for the great tribulation, it begins the second the church is removed. Then you've got seven years, and that's, that's it. So he says, I'll, I'm going to bring you out of that, um, that time to test those who are on the earth. And that's what the great tribulation does. It proves those on the earth. Okay, so you didn't trust Christ when you should have, and you're left behind. Will you trust him now? Now that your mom's gone, and your dad's gone, and your uncle's gone. Now that people came out and they said, oh, UFOs stole everybody away, or whatever the case is, but yet you know full well because your family's told you about this time, and now they're gone. Will you trust him now? Because what's coming upon the scene is a man who replace Christ instead of Christ. And he'll bring a false peace to the whole earth. And watch out, you might fall in love with him. But don't. Because he'll cause people to receive a mark. And if you take that mark, you're done. To prove people. And we're going to get into that as we look at the mark of the beast and all that. But it comes down to this. You, you will choose Christ or this man. Is it going to be a microchip? Is it going to be a nuclear war? You will have to identify with Christ and die. Or identify with this man and live. That's it. And if you identify with Christ and die, you go up under the altar in heaven and you wait there for a time until he lets you out and you get to be in heaven with God for eternity. But if you, if you don't identify with Christ and die during the great tribulation, then you identify with this false man and you have eternity in damnation. Eternity in hell. And that's a promise from God. And that just, that's just how it is. He lays it down that way. So he says, I'm going to keep you from that time. He has a lot of encouragement to the church in Philadelphia. Verse 11, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. Strong words there. What he's saying is, is I, I will bring you close to me without delay on my part. You're going to face persecution. You're going to face the fire of persecution. Many of you are going to die in my name. But I will be close to you. I'll bring you to myself. As, as your life burns in the fires of persecution and your heart stops beating, your ears will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Hold on to that. He's saying hold on to that. Because we press on this by faith in trusting him in that. So what he's saying is seize hold of what you possess now. What do you possess now? Your faith in Christ. It's not my sight. It's not my laborious works. What I have now is faith that Jesus is the Savior of my soul because God said it. Faith to believe that he, was, he came to this earth from heaven, went to the cross willingly, and died on that cross putting my sins to death and his blood being shed now makes atonement for me before the Father in heaven. And I am forgiven and eternally his and will be with him for eternity. And that is what I hold. What you and I possess now, it's called faith. I was sharing this on Wednesday night. I know a lot of people who, who are engineers and scientists and, uh, and they always have something to bring up to me in the word. And they, they figure it all out scientifically. And they go, see, it proves the word of God. And I'm like, I'm sorry, man, my brain doesn't work that way. All I have is faith. I believe if God said it, it's true. And it settles it for me. And I'm glad I'm not a scientist or have an engineering brain. <laughs> because I don't need it to make sense. God's word doesn't have to make sense to me. Or do I even have to understand it? 
If he said it, it's true, I believe it. That's faith. And what we hold now, we hold by faith. Do you ever have family members say to you, prove it? And you go, well, I haven't studied the Bible enough to really prove it to you. Hold on. You don't have to study the Bible enough to prove it. Just read the Word of God. Holy Spirit can take whatever's inside you and use it for His glory. But just take a stand and say, well, I just trust what God says by faith. Well, that's dumb. Well, really? It may be dumb to you, but it's not dumb to me. And I trust him completely by faith. And if he said this is what's going to happen, he's going to catch me up in the air and I'm going to meet him in the air with everybody else that died just before me, then that's exactly what's going to happen. Because he said it and it's crystal clear. And, and, and you can do that. So he says, seize hold. Seize hold. Grab with all you got. Don't let it go. Anybody here doesn't feel worthy enough to be a Christian? Oh, wow, well, look, there's everybody. Wow, well, imagine that. We don't grab hold of the physical. We grab hold of the spiritual. We grab hold of faith. And we trust by faith, and we hold on to it. And I'm going to tell you right now, the second you grab hold and seize hold of your faith in Christ, the enemy will come right in, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to throw at you all your flesh. He's going to throw your sin at you. He's going to show you how, how evil you really are and what a hypocrite you sound like. In fact, don't even go to church because everybody's going to mock you and ridicule you and make fun of you because you're such a hypocrite. Look at your life. Look at your past. The second you grab hold of faith in Christ, the enemy comes right in to lie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just do what I do. You go, so? Because it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm redeemed, baby. I remind him because he reminds me a lot. Anytime I'm, I grab hold of by faith in something I'm studying, the enemy comes right in. Oh, remember last week? Remember that? Remember last year? And I go, so? <laughs> I'm redeemed, baby. Washed by the blood of Christ. I remember one time a lady, I was telling her that. She's like, don't say that. Because he'll hit you even harder. He'll belt away, baby. I'm saved by faith in Christ. And that fact is settled in this heart. And it will never be unsettled. It ain't by sight that I walk with the Lord. It's by faith in Christ. And he says, you hold on to that. And in what I've done for you, you died for me. And then he's saying, and then in what I'll do through you. So you hold on to that faith in who I am to you. And you hold on to that faith in what I've done for you. And you hold on to that faith in what I'll do through you. And when you do, no one will stumble you. No one. Right in this room alone, there are so many ministers of Christ in this room. There is someone needs to hear your story. There is somebody desperately needs. And they're thinking, I'm all alone. Nobody knows what I've had to face and all the difficulties I've had. Nobody does that. And then you step into their life and you tell them what God brought you through in your life to salvation. And they go, oh, I can't believe it. Not you. I look at you and you got it all together. You go, I don't have it all together. What you see is Christ in me, if you see any good at all. But there's so much we have to share with the people around us that's of Christ. God brought you through this. You have a ministry then to share that. You know someone that's going through something you've faced your whole life. Pull your life out into theirs. And they may fight you at first, but just love them. Love them. Take them out for coffee. They'll be trying to figure out, what do they really want? What do they want? Just want to love you. Just want to show you how much God loves you. Oh, God can't love me. I've been so bad. You haven't been as bad as me. No way. Everybody think here they've been as bad as me or worse than me? Some of you think so. Oh, no way, man. <laughs> We're not going to write a book about that one. But uh, right here in, in, this, in our fellowship alone. If we were to take all the good deeds we've done and match them to the bad deeds we've done, which volume would be thicker? We don't even want to go down that road. We're forgiven. And we share that. And, and what happened to the church in Philadelphia is they got that. 
They got it. They, they come out of Catholicism. And so, you know, you've you got this generations have been caught up in Catholicism and just a religious way made by man to represent God. And then to come out of that and to come to know Christ, it's like you've been set free. In fact, you're so free, you got the love of God in you now. And you know beyond more than anybody else that you don't deserve it. And what do you do? You get up there and say, you know what, Lord? This is by faith. I trust you. I am sharing your love with others. Because they need to hear this too. They need to hear that you love them. They need to hear that you want to then pour yourself into them and then work through them for your glory. And that you can do it. You can touch these lives. So by faith, you know, we know who Jesus is to us. And by that same faith, we know what he's done for us. And by that same faith, we know what he will do through us to a lost and dying world. is to reach them for Christ. And the church in Philadelphia really got that. In verse 12, he says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. What he's saying literally, um, to he who overcomes, you, you know, without wavering, pressing on by faith. This is not works here, overcoming. It's faith holding on to that faith and never letting it go, no matter what. To he who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar, he says, in the temple of my God. He will not go out from it uh, anymore. A pillar, it's a support that carries much weight and cannot be moved. And he's speaking here about being a strong pillar and carrying the truth of the gospel both in the church and outside of the church. It's no longer that you come into the temple of God, you then become the temple of God. And everywhere you go, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, not just his presence, but then his power to bring the truth of the gospel out. That's why I always say, don't ever share the gospel through eschatology, through last day stuff. Because people will immediately take their eyes off Christ and put them on the world. And when are we to show the loss of the world? Never. We show them Christ. God will take care of all last day stuff. That's a guarantee. They, they shouldn't be looking for the Antichrist. They should be looking for Jesus Christ in that. And that's the showing there. So he says you'll become a pillar in that. Uh, in the house of the Lord, no more wavering in and out or back and forth. You will become a support and a strength for others in the house of the Lord. And he says, I'll write on him, you know, my name. It's the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, uh, and my new name. So I'll write on him. It means I'll identify with him. Everywhere you go, I will identify with you. This is really important. Because my whole Christian life, I have tried so hard to identify with the Lord. Did you ever do that? <laughs> Lord, I want to identify with you everywhere I go. And Jesus said, everywhere you go, I'll identify with you. Everywhere you go, I sent him there. He represents me here. I brought him there. Oh, Lord, I'm in this place. It's so dark. It's so difficult. There's nothing but pressure on me. And I cave into it. And God said, I identify with you. I sent you there. Because there are people there that would never have ever heard my name. Oh, but I told them and they don't want to hear it. But you told them. And now they know of me. And I can work with that. But wherever you go, whatever you face, I'll identify with you. The church needed to know this because many would face time in prison alone. Alone. Chained. Do you ever think you're alone? Anybody here ever think you're alone sometimes? You go, man, I'm so alone. You're not alone. You go to fellowship of believers. You're not chained in a stone cell with no clothes. With no food unless somebody brings it to you. 
You're not chained there. You can get up and leave anytime you want. You can find fellowship with anybody. You go, I'm all alone. Nobody visits me. Get out of your house and go walk 10 miles to someone's home. You're not alone. But they're going to face being alone. And they needed to know, Lord, I'm in this prison. And the only way I'm getting out of here is to lose my head. There's no other way out. And I needed to know, thank you, that you identify with me here. The only people I can talk to or show who you are is these prison guards. Maybe those are the prison guards that one day stand in the Colosseum and lay their lives down for Christ because they saw what you did. You don't know what I'm doing providentially because I don't explain myself. But I am working behind the scenes all the time. And you need to know, wherever you go, I identify with you. It speaks of an intimacy and a privilege to know him personally and to make him personally known. That he identifies with me wherever I go. And then he talks about his name. I'll write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God. Name here in all of it means character and authority. And what he's saying here is everywhere you go, everything you do from now on will be for me, for my glory, and for my people. You will be wholly mine. No longer is it you trying to identify with me. I identify with you and what I am putting on you is my name, my authority, my character. And everywhere you go, you now represent me. And it's more than just representing me because I am dwelling in you and desire to dwell through you to others. You have Christ in you. Every one of us in this room that have trusted Jesus Christ to be Savior, you have Christ in you. And he'll never leave you and never forsake you. But you know what he will do? As you share the gospel with someone else, He'll he'll go knock on the door of their heart. He'll begin to show them who he is, one step at a time. And he'll never leave you, but one day they'll put their faith and trust in him, and he'll dwell in them too, while never leaving you. And that's what he shows here in a very strong way. Every way you go, everything you do from now on will be for me, for my glory, for my people, you will be wholly mine. And he talks about a new name. Uh, This is really kind of cool. My new name. It literally means covered by the righteousness of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're washed in the blood of Christ. But do you know, church, that you're covered by the righteousness of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? You go into some colleges today and you tell people, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. They laugh at you. They make fun of you. Because to them, Jesus is what he was back in the dark ages. Nothing. Nothing at all. But you can stand there and you can say, you know what? I'm washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know what that means? I'm covered by the righteousness of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know what that means? Nothing can touch me Unless he allows it. And if he allows it, if he closes a door, then that door is closed. And my responsibility is to turn from it. It's a closed door. Not to try to reopen it. And if he opens a door, he's telling me, step into it. But I'm afraid. I don't know what's behind it. I'm with you. I identify with you. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. And the the, the Philadelphia church, whether they thought about it or not, needed to hear this. Because this word had been recorded and then put into a Bible uh, later on as times went on. And by the time the 18th century came, the men and women that God used during that time to evangelize the world desperately needed the encouragement from this letter for them. They needed to know, you'll never let me go. And in my eyes, where I look like I've failed, or I've blown a witness, or I've stumbled in one way, you're saying to me, it doesn't even exist. Get up, get past it, and keep going. Because I will never leave you. 
And my desire is to use you to reach others for my glory in that with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 13, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And again, let this message sink deep into the ears of anyone who's listening to what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. It speaks of time here. That means God will continually speak this word over and over. That means when I'm dead and gone, if the rapture hasn't happened yet, some other guy younger than me is going to come up here and teach this same word, and it's going to go out just as relevant to the people that he's teaching, because why? It's the word of God. And they'll be challenged to him who has ears to hear. Let him hear with the Spirit. What's the Spirit of God saying to you today? Well, you know, last week, no. No. What's the Spirit of God saying to you today? Turn from that, change the direction here. Step out and reach that person, whatever it may be. He's saying, this is what I'm saying to you through my word. Hear it and then do it. Take that step. You don't need to fear when God's on your side. And God is on your side. Christ is with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. So he can say with all authority to him who is able to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches all through time, for the last 2,000 years, it's been saying the same thing and it reaches people in a different way nonstop every single time because it's the Word of God. And that's the church in Philadelphia. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to spend in your Word. And I pray, Lord, that you would take your word that was taught today, plant it deep in every heart. Let it accomplish all you set it out to do. And each one of us, Lord, individually and corporately as a fellowship, let it be watered by your Holy Spirit so that it might take root, not be stolen away from the enemy. Let it bear fruit for your glory. Let it continue to assure us that Christ is with us and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, guide us, direct us, and see us through. In this little valley where you've brought us, you have a purpose and a reason that goes beyond what we can comprehend. Lead us in that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.